This meeting of the March 29th meeting of Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We have two bills on the agenda. We're going to start with Senator Putnam, Senate File 548. Welcome to the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here for my first time. Uh, and thank you, members, for uh, listening to this bill. Uh, Senate File 548 establishes uh, some resources for the Rural Finance Authority. Agricultural is capital intensive, especially these days. You know, a farmer recently told me, a farmer from Avon was telling me about how his property went from $600 an acre to $6,000 an acre in just a couple years. I was talking to another farmer uh, from out that area, dairy farmer, uh, who was telling me a little bit about his struggles to buy farm implements and equipment. And he said, from his experience, inflation in farm equipment is 25%. It's hard to farm these days, and it's gotten a lot harder. And that's where the Rural Finance Authority comes in. Since 1986, the RFA has supplied the capital for those who supply our food, providing financing options that are not available from other credit sources and loans to begin business, expand it, or recover from a disaster. Now, in that span since 1986, the RFA has issued almost 4,000 loans totaling over $350 million. And now of all those loans, only 21 have gone south. That ratio, that 0.002% of lost loans, is testimony to the acumen and care of the administrators of the program, but also to the grit, ethic, and skill of Minnesota's farmers. Five of the RFA's programs are funded through the sale of GO bonds. The beginning farmer, the seller assisted, the ag improvement, the livestock extension, and the restructure to loan program. The beginning farmer program in particular accounts for about 70% of the bonds issued. The RFA, though, doesn't just supply capital. It collaborates with local lenders, building their capacity and ability to do what is right for their communities. A 2020 authorization of $50 million for the RFA is set to expire this October. This bill simply authorizes another $50 million bond to allow this good work to continue and to help our farmers keep doing better. If we don't help our farmers now, we'll be left with one big corporate farm. We've already seen this process begin. We have fewer than 2,000 dairy farms in the state of Minnesota for the first time in the history of the state. We have two paths, help farmers or have no farmers. Thank you for consideration of this proposal and I ask for your support. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Questions from the committee, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair Marty, and uh, thank you for bringing the bill forward, um, Senator Putnam, and uh, a good program, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I, I did have a question, though, with, um, you know, someone that keeps a, an eye on interest rates and, and how that affects small businesses and farmers are our uh, small businesses, what are the interest rates looking like and what have they been um, with this program? Have they doubled like a lot of interest rates have? Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. I don't know the exact numbers of the interest rates as they are right now, but my understanding is that those interest rates have increased, and that's part of why the expenditure has expired so quickly. You know, in past years, if you look at the last uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years, the amount of money that we've put into RFA, it expired more quickly this time than it did in the past. And I'm assuming, Senator Dreheim, acknowledging my ignorance of the exact numbers, that the interest rate uh, comment that you bring up is part of that issue. Follow-up, Chair? Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody in the audience would have the answer to that or, or Mr. Nauman would have any idea on, on, I think it's a pretty important piece is what, you know, what are we, great program, and it, and it gets utilized year after year. Um, you know, this being the seventh year I've been in the Senate, um, we keep on funding this and it keeps on getting used up and, and I hear good things out there. But I think it is important for us to look at what that interest rate is doing. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Ryan Rolis. I'm the senior loan officer with the Rural Finance Authority. Um, Senator, your question is, um, our rates right now are between 5% and 55 
Um, if you would have compared that to a year ago, we were at four. Um, and it, just reviewing some of our loans that we had just even a couple of years ago, that RFA was at 2%. Um, the one nice thing is, is we are seeing that the bank rates are between at seven and eight percent. So with RFA being at five, you know, we still got a two, three percent margin in there or Im improvement of rates than what the lender can currently offer. Thank you. Okay. And then um, on most commercial paper, um, you know, we're, we're asked to put um, 20 percent down uh, for a commercial loan. Um, when, when you go to an SBA program, um, you know, it can be up to 35% down for some. What, what do you require uh, on this? Sure. Chair, Senator, um, the one nice thing is a farmer can also use the farm service agency programs, um, so under USDA. And two of the programs they have, there's a 0% down program and there's a 5% down program. And so we can partner with that. And usually what happens is Farm Service Agency will take a second position behind the bank and RFA. So in a lot of cases, the RFA risk is 50% loan to value. Um, that gets back to the numbers that the Senator was giving you of. That's why our loan losses have been so good, because we work in conjunction with other lenders. And Mr. Chair, Senator Graham, if I may add to that as well, the, the five different programs have different characteristics as well. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your answers. Uh, Chair, I, I had one more question, and, and that has to do with the uh, 50,000 in um, appropriations for the bond sale through MMB. Um, I, I don't know, Mr. Nauman, is that normal to have that dollar amount? I don't know what it costs to sell bonds. Um, so just being new on the committee, it would be nice to know a little Mr. more about Nauman. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Graham, that's a normal percentage for bond sale, bond expenses associated with a, a sale of debt. Senator Friends and Senator Dames. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Putnam, for bringing this forward. Uh, very important funding and the uses which we put it to in the past are one of the reasons we have to pass this, get it going, and get it back into the hands of Minnesotans. I just want to point out for the committee um, the advantage to the beginning farmer loans. We're trying to have the next generation of farmers come up, and as you know, rural Minnesota is older demographically, and we do a lot of things for jobs and economic development across the state, including in the metro. Um, and so the other aspect I just want to call the committee's attention attention to is this is something we do for rural Minnesota and it's aptly named because it has a huge impact without the beginning farmer part of it I think it's much less attractive and so very proud to vote yes for it and thank you again Senator Putnam thanks Mr. Chair thank you Senator Dames well thank you Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Senator Putnam I'm not sure if you will have the answer or if the gentleman with you will but uh, as uh, Senator French said, this is a very important bill, and I certainly would agree with that. Uh, it's uh, done a lot of good work over the years using this. But just a couple of questions. Uh, are there any variable loans through this process, or are they all the interest rates set? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, we do fix them, and so the rates are fixed for up to 10 years. And normally we only do repricing about once a year. And so that's reflected on the bond sales that we have in the summer is when we reflect what those new current interest rates are. Uh, thank you. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Can you tell me what kind of a default rate you have? Yes, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, I believe we had mentioned that we've only had 21 charged off loans out of over 3,800. Mm-hmm. So on that, roughly the dollar amount of those accumulated is about $575,000 over the course of lending out $360 million. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Can you tell me what the procedure you use is on these defaults? Uh, Senator, um, Chair, we use the bank as our main lender. So we are a participating lender, so we follow with the bank on their lead, on their collection process. Um, the one unfortunate thing when you're dealing with farmland or farms is it does take a, a long time to collect on those. Sometimes we currently have one that's past due and we've been in it for two years until we finally can foreclose on it later this year. Mm -hmm. Follow up, Mr. Chair. 
could. Can you tell tell me what the majority of the loans are used for? I know that they're participation loans, but are they used more for buying equipment? Are they used more for for the uh, operating cost or for down payment on land? Uh, you give me some idea what those loans are used for. Sure, Mr. Chair, Senator. Majority of what we finance is real estate based. We finance very little machinery and we do not finance operating. So majority of our portfolio is secured by a first real estate loan. Specifically for the five programs, we're asking for the $50 million. That's in the statute that we require to have a first real estate mortgage as collateral. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dames, if I may uh, interject for a moment. If you uh, just articulate the five different programs, we'll see that they have different points of emphasis. One is about restructuring loans, and that's what that's about. But then if you also go back to my presentation, and we hear that 70% of those loans are to the beginning farmer program, uh, those are for land acquisition specifically. So that's further detail uh, to the information that was uh, mentioned earlier. So it, it's a function of the five different types of loans that are part of the program. But the parts of the program that are the most uh, used are those that are about land acquisition in addition. Uh, thank you, Senator Putnam. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So can you tell me, Senator Putnam, we're talking about the five different divisions that that money can be used for. Can you give me an idea kind of what percent each division is using as far as for loan rate, as far as money being loaned out? You're saying 70% is for, probably for beginning farmers. So you got the other four categories. What kind of a, the balance of that, how is that split up between those four categories? Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, it might be useful for edification if I talk through what the five different programs themselves are. Perhaps that would be helpful. Uh, and then we'll ask our friend to get into a little bit more of the math. That'd be great. Uh, so Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, the five programs, the beginning farmer loan program that is about purchasing agricultural land. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Seller Assisted Loan Program, which is a cooperative financing effort where the seller actively participates in financing the sale of their farm, providing a portion of the financing, and the lender and the RFA provide the balance of the funds with the first mortgage. So that's an extension largely of the beginning farmer tax credit. The Agricultural Improvement Program, which assists eligible farmers with financing of capital improvements to their farming operation. Uh, the Livestock Expansion Program, which creates affordable financing for new state-of-the-art livestock production facilities. And last, the Restructure Loan Program, which helps farmers reorganize their debt to improve cash flow. And did I stall long enough? You did. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, roughly the breakdown, like we said, is 70% is the beginning farmer loan. Um, just about 12% is for the Ag Improvement Loan. The restructure holds about 9%, and then the livestock expansion is also about 11%. So again, the majority is mainly beginning farmer, and then it's a fair, fairly divided between the other programs. Uh, Mr. Chair, follow up. Go ahead. So can you tell me on the Ag Improvement Loan, would that be for like updating machinery? Would it be for uh, increasing usability of buildings? Uh, is that kind of what that would be used for? Sir, Mr. Chair, Senator, majority of the ag improvement is exactly like it states, is an agricultural improvement. Majority of what we see it used for is livestock buildings, brand new livestock facilities is majority of what those finance. Um, it could be used for a bin site if someone chose to do that. It could be for, say, a new machine shed. Again, we just require a first real estate mortgage. Um, that's why sometimes it... It's nice to use it on livestock buildings because they're on their own separate parcel. So you might split away five acres and build that brand new barn just on that five acres so it, um, it makes it really clean. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. So further discussion, if not Senator Friends move Senate file 548 be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor, uh, cameras on for those who are on Zoom. Um, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Putnam and Mr. Rolls. Senate file, the House file 19, Senator Pappas. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair and members. I'll just make a few opening comments um, and I'll explain a little bit about the financing in the bill, and then Mr. Nauman will help me if I run into problems. 
Yeah. Uh, Minnesotans care for one another, and we want Minnesota to be a caring state where all our families can be healthy and safe. I'm bringing this bill up today because we all know that everyone gets sick, regardless of how long they've been working for their employer, whether they're full-time or part-time, or even the size of their employer. The pandemic was another reminder that when people get sick, they should be able to stay home, not just for their own health or that of a loved one, but the health of all of us. This bill would ensure Minnesota is a state where regardless of the color of your skin, your income, or where you work, you can be there when your sick child needs you, where you can go to the doctor before your illness goes from bad to worse, where you can take the time to recover from an illness or seek support in the wake of a sexual assault without worrying about missing bills or losing your job. Unfortunately for far too many, especially those we called essential during the pandemic, this isn't the Minnesota they experience. An estimated 36% of working people, that's 932,000 Minnesotans, don't have any paid sick and safe time. This means that in a state with the second most Fortune 500 companies per capita, more than a third of working people in our state face a terrible choice between caring for themselves or loved ones in need and the loss of wages or even the loss of employment. Because in many circumstances, it's still legal for workers to be fired for needing to take time off to care for themselves or loved ones. This is also a public health issue, since many of the employees least likely to have paid sick time work in jobs such as food service, where choosing to come in and work while sick can have real health implications for the general public. Make no mistake, study after study shows that workers who have only unpaid or no sick time are significantly more likely to go to work when they're sick and pass their illness to their coworkers and customers. I'd like to cover the question of cost to employers, which has come up in past hearings to more than a little confusion. The simplest answer is that according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and their quarterly national compensation surveys of employer costs for employee compensation, employers in our region who offer this benefit report that the average cost of providing paid sick time to their employees was just three quarters of 1% of total labor costs prior to the pandemic. And even during the pandemic, they only went up 9 tenths of 1% of total compensation. For a full-time worker, that comes out to between 15 and 19 hours of sick time used per, year on, used per year on average, nowhere near the maximum accrual of 48 hours in this bill. Why is that? Well, according to the research I mentioned, as well as many other studies, employees simply don't use every hour of sick time they earn or they can earn. They appreciate the security of knowing they can bank it for when they need it to care for themselves or loved ones. And the cost to employers don't even take into account the savings they see when they do offer earned sick and safe time. Businesses that provide earned sick time report less employee turnover, meaning lower training costs, less spreading of illness to consumers, to customers or even other coworkers, meaning less absenteeism, lower employer health care costs through better use of preventive care, and lower presenteeism or coming to work sick, all of which means higher productivity, fewer workplace injur injuries, and a healthier Minnesota. And for small businesses, this legislation also levels the playing field. Many small businesses offer paid sick days throughout Minnesota because they know it's the right thing to do for their employees, their customers, and their communities. But those small businesses are often competing with big box stores and large out-of-state employers that haven't offered the same benefit, all while reaping record profits during the pandemic. This bill levels the playing field by ensuring that all employers provide this basic standard to their Minnesota workers. Ultimately, this bill is about becoming the kind of caring state that I think we all want Minnesota to be. Um, members, um, I have an amendment, the A8 amendment, and I'm just going to um, explain the appropriations and what the amendment will do. And members, the A8 amendment is in the packets. Right. Chair. Senator Dayhan. I would I'd like to roll call this amendment and have it put in the journal. Sure. Okay, roll call has been requested, and, and, and we've got three hands, so it'll be put in the journal. Yes, um, go ahead, Senator. Thank Pappas, you, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the bulk of this bill will fund the Department of Labor and Industry. It'll fund them to do education and outreach staff in, tw in fiscal year 24 to develop trainings and materials to ensure that employers, employees, and HR companies are ready for the start of earned sick and safe time. It'll fund investigators and administrative support staff, one-time rulemaking costs, and updates to the existing labor standards case management system. 
Finally, based on best practices learned from other states and localities, including Minneapolis, there's $300,000 in each fiscal year is appropriated for grants to community organizations to do education and outreach to workers. So what the amendment does is it releases some of these small appropriations that were actually, um, some of them were eliminated in earlier committees, but when I took up the House file, they were no longer eliminated. But they're just small appropriations that we believe and fiscal staff believes that the, the agency or the entity can absorb and we don't need to include them in this bill. And before we go through the uh, spreadsheet and other information, um, Mr. Nauman, do you want to explain why there's a spreadsheet? With this? Mr. Chair, I was uncertain if you wanted to act on the A8 before. Sure, we can, or, or we can act on the A8 <laughs> at this time. There was a request for a roll call on that. Those on Zoom, please turn on your cameras. Um, staff will take the roll. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Morty. Senator Friends. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Champion? Aye. Senator Dames? No. Senator Dreheim? No. Senator Eichhorn? No. Senator Mohammed? Aye. Senator Murphy? Aye. Senator Pappas? Aye. Senator Westrom? Senator Wickland? Senator Westrom. There being six ayes and four nays, the motion prevails. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that my Republican colleagues voted against this because these were suggestions that were made by Republicans in previous committees that I accepted. Um, and maybe I wasn't clear enough on page 18, we were really deleting these small appropriations that we felt that could be absorbed by the agency. And that's what we were doing. So we were making the bill cheaper. Chair, sure. can, can I comment on that? Senator Pappas, thank you for, uh, for the comments. But I, I think the Article Four part was the the main part that we. Oh, I see. Agree Article with, Four, right? I got know, it. And what that does to our nursing homes, and, and so that that's the reason we oppose the amendment. I, the other I get parts it. And we I, agree I on. neglected to explain that we were deleting that in this amendment, so I apologize. Um, I forgot that was at the top of the amendment, and that was basically the chairman has said it had to be deleted because it's over our target. Okay. Mr. Nauman, do you want to explain the spreadsheet before Mr. Olson goes So, through? Mr. Chair and members, um, the fiscal note became available yesterday afternoon, and we were um, in our office. We took a quick look at it and thought it might be helpful to prepare a, a short spreadsheet that would reconcile um, what, what the committee has ultimately adopted as well as what was in the original fiscal note. Um, so what you have in front of you is uh, a spreadsheet that does exactly that. It identifies the costs that were identified in the, in the, in the, by agency and by fund for, e for each agency that reflected an expense um, in the fiscal note. Those are the columns that are titled fiscal note summary. Everything in green is the tails. Everything in white is the 24-25 biennium. <clears throat> then the next columns identified as the A8 amendment re uh, re reflects fewer costs, the ones that were removed, um, as well as re uh, the expenses that remain in the bill after the A8 amendment, as well as any revenue sources. So we can talk about that. Um, I think uh, Mr. Olson is here and is prepared to walk through the spreadsheet at your pleasure, if that's, if sure. that's preferred. Senator Jay Hamm. Uh, Mr. Nauman, why isn't there any, exp I don't see it, maybe I'm missing it, for uh, Men State or the U of M. I would think they would be two of the biggest agencies that would be affected with all the part-time help they have on campus and work study programs, et cetera. So Mr. Chair and, um, and uh, Senator Draham, they were not identified um, in the fiscal note. I mean, I suppose we can uh, go back and 
determine whether or not they, they should have been assigned to the fiscal note itself, but I don't believe they were assigned in the original instance. I can check while we're having further conversation. Uh, Chair Marty? Go ahead, Ms. Senator Jam. I, I think Senator Pappas wanted to weigh in on that. If Senator Pappas, do you have any idea why they're not included? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Graham, I don't know if the fiscal note extends to them or not, the request for feedback, but it's kind of a philosophical thing that I think you sh all should appreciate is that, you know, if we're asking businesses to absorb this cost and we think it's going to be good practice for them and good business practice for them to provide sick pay for their employees for the reasons that I mentioned in my opening comments, then, you know, why isn't also not good fiscal practice for state government or any kind of state agencies, they should be providing this benefit for, for a public health reason and to provide good benefits. Um, uh, my guess is that most of them already do provide it, and we certainly have not heard anything from the systems through all the committees I've been through um, raising any concerns or complaints. Chair? Senator Jayheim. Has, uh, and Senator Pappas, has this been to higher education? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Graham, no, they didn't request it. Uh, um, Mr. Olson, do you want to go through the spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of this committee. As Mr. Nauman stated, this uh, reflects the bill in its current f form. Uh, so the first column on the left side explains the agency and the change item within the fiscal note. The next column, the fund column, explains if it's from the general fund or from the or non-general fund expense. Uh, the next two columns, the fiscal note summary, uh, describe the fiscal note uh, in its 32 pages. And, and again, the current fiscal note does not include Article 4 within the costs. So beginning with labor, uh, beginning with expenditure changes for the Department of Labor and Industry, on row six, we see enforcement, compliance, outreach, and engagement activities, including staffing costs of 1.4 million in fiscal year 24, 2.2 million in fiscal year 25 for a biennial total of 3.7 uh, 3 million approximately in, for 24, 25, and then approximately 1.9 million uh, per fiscal year ongoing in the tails uh, for a fiscal, for a biennial total of 3.8 million of general fund expenses in fiscal year 26, 27. And then for those community organization grants administered by the Department of Labor and Industry, that is $300,000 in fiscal year 24 and $300,000 in fiscal year 25. Uh, this is one time, so it's a uh, 600,000 for fiscal year 24, 25. So the total general fund expense to the Department of Labor and Industry is $1,745,000 in fiscal year 24, uh, $2,509,000 in fiscal year 25, for a total of 4.254 uh, million in fiscal year 24-25. And then in the tails, it's, uh, uh, the biennial total is $3,798,000. Uh, moving on to the Minnesota management and budget expenses. expenses. Um, and again, I'm just focusing on the fiscal note as it, it currently is, not after the amendment. Mr. Nauman can explain any changes after that. Uh, for uh, beginning on line 11, for the general fund, uh, for additional expenses for 24-7 staffing for earned sick and safe leave for state agencies, it's 127,000 in fiscal year 24. Uh, 261,000 fiscal year 25 for 388,000 in 24, 25 biennial total. And then for in the tails in 26, 27, the total is 522,000 from the general fund. Uh, for, oh, sorry. Just for the rest of the spreadsheet, you might as well just go through what's in the bill now. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, the expenses to Minnesota management and budget are no longer included within the bill. Uh, the expenses are this exact. Just to pause for a minute, we did speak oh, to, uh, the chair did speak to management and budget and they just, they decided wasn't, they worth their time to do this because it was a distribution through all the different agencies and for the few people that were not currently covered. And again, it's a belief that they should be covered. And just like we're asking small businesses and large businesses to be sure they do this, we should also expect that from state agencies. Chair. 
Can we ask council, where in the bill does it say that state agencies aren't included in this bill? Because, you know, when you think of who works part time, and I think that's the intent of your bill, um, Senator Pappas, is, is to help out those part time workers. And, and I would think that Men State, U of M, and probably the DNR are probably the three biggest employers of part time staff that we have, you know, in the 70, 80,000 state employees that we hire every year. Um, and I don't see them identified in the fiscal note. So are they exempt as drafted, or is the fiscal note incomplete? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dreheim, they are not exempt. Then, uh, Chair, if I could. So then, uh, I, I, and I, I, I've had friends work for the state, and I do not remember them telling me that they got earned sick time for part-time help. So I, I think we have a, a little bit of an issue here. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Graham, it's pretty minimal. When you think, um, um, I don't know if you've been in any previous committees, and I, I didn't go through all the details of the bill. Um, I certainly could do that, or staff could do that. But you earn one hour for 30 hours. So, you know, depending on what your part-time hours is, it's an hourly thing. It's not a day thing or a week thing or anything. It's one hour for every 30 hours, up to 48 hours. Um, but, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you, you know, the colleges hire a ton of students. Mm -hmm. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids um, at all the universities throughout the state. And colleges, of course, would be less. So that 30 hours would add up. Just the sporting events at, in uh, Center Francis District, um, you know, for one one football game, they could have 50 kids working. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do think there is a fiscal impact, and I'd hate to straddle our higher education uh, Entities with with the fiscal burden in a time where their budgets are already tight due to lower enrollment So I think we have to look at it a little farther uh, Mr. Chairman just one final comment and we'll turn it back to uh, fiscal analysts here um, Mr. Chairman young students get sick as well, and they're very dependent on those dollars to help pay for their education So, you know, I think they should be included Mr. Nelman, did you want to comment on the... So, Mr. Chair and um, members, I'll just take a quick... I'm not sure if this is additive or, su or subtracts from where you're headed, but um, in the fiscal note, you'll note that uh, Minnesota Management and Budget responded to the fiscal note request on behalf of the enterprise, so on behalf of all state agencies. And so the pricing that they identified was the cost for all of state government. I presume that would... That would include Minsky. I'm uncertain if it if it includes um, the University of Minnesota, but I suspect it would. Um, but we can do a little bit of additional uh, spade work to ensure that that's in fact the case. Um, and then in conversations with Minnesota Management and Budget yesterday, this was not part of the governor's recommendation on behalf of you know paying for those paying for those costs. And Senator Pappas. Um, um, made the decision to remove those costs or not pay for those costs specifically in this particular piece of legislation. Mr. Wilson, please continue. Okay, so now moving on to uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings. So on line 18 for rulemaking by DLI, this is all non-general fund money. Uh, there would be a one-time cost in fiscal year 20. Uh, 25 of, for rulemaking of $33,000. On line 19 for admin uh, administrative law judge hearings, uh, it's approximately $12,000 per fiscal year. Uh, you will notice that there will be uh, revenues that offset this in farther down in the spreadsheet. Uh, moving down to the le legislature, um, uh, we are not spending the bill as it currently is for the time card HR reporting system modifications for the House of Representatives. Uh, the original bill had $18,000 for that. The updated bill has uh, does not appropriate funds towards that purpose. Uh, for the Supreme Court, for printing costs and additional district court and additional district court judge, the updated bill with the A8 amendment again does not appropriate funds towards this purpose. Um, and then, so for the total general fund spending, looking on line 33, 
Uh, for the fiscal year 24-25 biennium, we're looking at $4,254,000. And in the fiscal year 26-27 biennium, this is $3,798,000 in general fund spending. Uh, for the non-general fund expenditures, it's 57,000 for fiscal year 24, 25, and 24,000 for fiscal year 26, 27. And so for total expenditures on line 35, it's $4,311,000 in all fund spending in fiscal year 24, 25, and uh, 3,822,000 in 26, 27. Now, moving down to revenue changes for the Department of Labor and Industry. So for compliance penalty revenue, um, we're looking at 104,000, this is on line 43, we're looking at 104,000 in fiscal year 24 and 207,000 in fiscal year 25 for a 24-25 biennial total of $311,000. And then for the the $207,000 is assumed to be ongoing uh, in penalty revenue, so for $414,000 for 26-27 biennial total. And this is all general fund. Um, and for, on line 46, we see the, the non-general fund uh, revenues to the Office of Administrative Hearings, again, for the rulemaking by DLI and the administrative law judges that match up with lines 18 and 19. Um, so that, that matches up. So just to expedite things, I'll move on to line 52 for this Supreme Court. Um, this is general fund revenues from district court filing fees. So in fiscal year 25, it is assumed uh, $67,000 uh, to the general fund um, for a biennial total of $67,000 and then 73 per fiscal year ongoing for a 26-27 a biennial total of $146,000. That's on line 53. Uh, so for a total, uh, moving to line 57, for the total general fund revenue changes, we're looking at 378,000 to the general fund in fiscal year 24, for the 24-25 biennium and 560,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, for the Office of Administrative Hearings, uh, we're looking at 57,000 uh, in non-general fund money in 58, uh, and the 24-25 biennium and 24,000, 26, 27 biennium. Um, moving on down to the net all fund changes, um, we're looking at uh, 300, 3,876,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 3,238,000 in, in the 26-27 biennium. That's on line 64. And then um, move, uh, looking at line 73, just for the net general fund spending, uh, we're looking at 1,641,000 uh, uh, fiscal year 24, 2,235,000 fiscal year 25 for a biennial total of 3,876,000. And then in fiscal year 26 and 27, it's 1,619,000 each fiscal year for a total of 3,238,000 for the 26, 27 biennium. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Questions from the committee? Questions on the bill? If not, Senator Pappas moves. Uh, sure, I, I, Oh, Senator Jayheim, I'm sorry. Thank you, Senator Murdy. Um, I, Senator Pappas, thank you for your hard work on this. And um, I, I guess my main concern is with the smaller businesses um, and uh, some of the farm community farmers, if you will, because they would be considered a, a small business. Um, with the multiple stops that you've had on this bill, what is there any exemptions for the really small businesses for like? three or four employees. Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we certainly did look at that, but um, mostly the feedback we received is that um, employees who work for small businesses still get sick. And I think, you know, even if you have a small business, you, you certainly want to keep your employees. It's, it's a, there's a workforce shortage out there. You don't, the turnover can be expensive and costly for you as a small business. So. 
it's in your best interest to kind of keep them. And for the workers, it's in their best interest in terms of their health, of them and their family, to be able to remain on the job. It's a pretty low bar here, 48 hours a year. So I think that um, it should be doable for small businesses. Thank you. Further discussion, if not, Senator Pappas moves host file. Oops, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pappas, this, this, since this didn't go through the Jobs Committee, I have a, a, a couple of questions. Um, the bill states that uh, this is for employees that work at least 80 hours. Um, do they start accruing that time immediately, or how do you know someone's going to work 80 hours before... Uh, they start accruing this this time or please explain how that works. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Senator Pratt, that's a good question and we did talk about a vesting period but because they have to work 30 hours before they accrue one hour and then it would be another 30 hours before they accrue another hour. I mean, it's a really very slow process to gain your sick time. And again, it's 48 hours, six days a year. So it seemed like it would be, um, this approach would be very handleable by a small business, by part-time or seasonal workers. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senator Pappas, I work 30 hours, I accrue an hour. All of a sudden I go to my employer and I say, hey, I need an hour off. They don't have, I haven't worked 80 hours yet. Um, what's, according to the bill, as an employer, I have to grant that, even though I don't know that this employee is going to work 80 hours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Pratt, that's correct. If they need to leave an hour early to, for a dental appointment or take their, their child to the doctor, um, yes, you would have to grant that. So there really isn't, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there really isn't an 80-hour minimum because they can use it as soon as they accrue the first, the first hour after 30. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah, theoretically, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Is there anybody uh, on, on for MMB that can answer a quick question? I don't believe anybody's, nobody's on the Zoom and nobody from MMB is here. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, I think Senator Dreheim's uh, inquiries around uh, the impact of higher ed I, were, were valid, not only for, for Minnesota State, but for the University of Minnesota. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm you know, really concerned that we had a big change in this bill uh, posted 12 hours before the bill came to the, to the committee. Um, the fiscal note wasn't made to at least the minority members of this until 12 hours before the, uh, uh, the hearing. There's no reason that we're, we're pushing this thing because it's already made third deadline. But Mr. Chair, I would move that uh, we, set, we re refer uh, House File uh, 19 back to Human Services Reform, and I request a roll call. Senator Brett moves to send this back to human services reform. Human services, yes, yeah, called now. Okay. Okay. Um, he moves to move that back. Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did have a full hearing there. Um, I know Senator Hoffman is concerned about the cost, and uh, I think the decision was made that there was enough dollars in his budget to be able to pay nursing homes and other um, entities. Uh, that provide services to vulnerable people to be able to cover the cost of sick time if they're not already doing it. Senator Pratt. Oh, Senator, I'd oppose the amendment. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this was an amendment that was put on in Human Services uh, that we're taking out and has a direct fiscal impact to uh, the, the Department of Human Services and, and all of our long-term care providers, our, our personal care attendants, um, and if we're going to expect the agency then, or the, uh, uh, the, the individual employers to pick up this cost, then I think it needs to go back to human services reform, not only from a policy perspective of removing the amendment that was put on in that committee, uh, but also to ensure that they understand the, uh, the fiscal implications. Uh, so Mr. Chair, I, I urge members 
uh, to vote in favor of the motion. Let's move this back to human services reform and let's have them have the, let's have a conversation around, um, around, around this amendment and, and the change that was made. This is not a small change. Um, Oh, I had a thought and I just lost it. Um, but given that this was only available, right, not until about 8.30 last night, it came out on the listserv. Now, the majority had this fiscal note since, since 247, at least according to the, to the timestamp on the fiscal note that I have. Um, the, the amendment, I forgot to look at the timestamp on the amendment. Um, I don't know when that was, but but six thirty eight at six yeah. thirty eight. I mean, Mr. Chair, there is absolutely no reason this this bill is made third deadline. Um, we can send it back to Human Services Reform, but there's no reason for us to rush through this bill and get it and get it to the floor. Let's do our work right. I'm disappointed at you know at best how disrespectful the majority is running this committee, committee but it. It seems downright deceptive at some times how it's running the committee, and, and I think we need full transparency. So uh, let's do it right. Let's get this back, and, and let's have Human Services uh, react to the amendment and be able to weigh in. It's a policy that directly affects uh, their um, their area of expertise, and as Senator Champion has... has uh, uh, informed me this is not the area that we should be doing policy. This is the area we should be doing uh, finances. So, again, I've requested a roll call. Thanks, okay, Senator Pratt. Um, Senator Westrom, did you have a question about the comment your hand is raised about this amendment or about the bill? About this motion or the Mr. bill, I should say. Mr. Chair, um, it, it, it applies either way, so I thought I would just ask it now as we're discussing the referral because it helps either uh, confirm that we should re-refer it or not. So I'll, I'll just ask the question if that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pappas, uh, you talked about the 80-hour minimum threshold, but there is really no minimum 80-hour threshold uh, uh, technically. Um, there's a lot of ag uh, providers that buy or hire uh, uh, tractor drivers in the spring or the fall or uh, uh, grain grain haulers. Um, I don't know. Some some might not even get to 80. Um, it's, it's a few days here, a week here, uh, depending upon the size of the farm. Uh, what is the penalty for any one of those small operators that uh, doesn't have a uh, Good record system, uh, or keep uh, doesn't have an accurate doesn't keep accurate records, and might mistakenly uh, uh, not get this calculated right, or maybe never have somebody that goes over 80 hours, so they don't worry about it. What what is the penalty for them as a small business owner uh, if they don't have this uh, down uh, precisely? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Westrom. Um, uh, I, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be uh, required to provide paid sick days if their employee didn't work more than 80 hours. So I don't see where a penalty is relevant. In cases where uh, Dolly responds on a complaint basis, and we do have someone here from Dolly, I believe um, Ms. Gross is here. If we have more detailed questions, but there is language in the bill on in the penalty section that says they always have to look at. Um, the size of the business and the, um, uh, the you know, seriousness of the complaint. Is it a repeated complaint or is it a one-time complaint or not, when, even when they do decide that there should be a penalty. And Mr. Chairman, while I have the floor, I just wanted to mention that, um, to remind Senator Pratt, that for PCAs, that all PCAs, now the union contract does include paid sick time. So they are already covered, and that will be figured in the nursing home rates. And it doesn't just cover the unionized PCAs, but everyone. So that should also reduce the cost to nursing homes, because that cost will be covered. Senator Westrom, your hand is still up, is yep. it? Mr. Chair, a follow-up. Senator Pappas, uh, so, so let's just presume uh, small business uh, uh, X or farmer, farmer Y 
uh, has has uh, 100 hours of, of a part-time employer of employee uh, that's done some tractor driving or or uh, other other jobs. Uh, they're somewhere right over the threshold, 81 hours, 100 hours. What is the penalty going to be for them if they don't have it reported accurately? Uh, just just assuming that they went over the 80 hours, uh, but you've now contradicted yourself because you just said there's they don't have to report, they don't have to comply of 80 hours, but I just heard you uh, tell Senator uh, uh, Dreheim earlier, or Senator Pratt, I think it was, uh, that technically, if, if they wanted to collect an hour on their first 30 hours, they could. So I'm hearing you talk out of both sides of your mouth on that, but <laughs> just specifically, what is the penalty for the small business that went over 80 hours by a little bit and didn't get it reported, just so we know what we're, what they're going to be facing if, if they didn't get it right. Sir Pappas. Maybe we could ask Ms. Gross to come forward and address that. And Senator Westrom, I'm not trying to talk out of both sides of my mouth. I'm just, um, sometimes I just am not specific enough or clear enough, or maybe I'm struggling to understand myself. It's a, it's a new bill, and sometimes I may need assistance with that. But, and you give me hypotheticals that maybe we haven't thought of, I haven't thought of before, but I'm sure there's smart people out there that have thought of them. So let's say if you come on under the threshold and you've already granted your employee paid sick days, hours, you know, an hour or two, um, certainly you could decide then to deduct that out of the final paycheck because you really wouldn't be obligated to pay that employee. I mean, so there's really is, you know, there's kind of logical responses to these. Ms. Gross, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Jessica Gross and I'm the director <clears throat> of Labor Standards and Apprenticeship at DLI. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, um, or I'll answer um, in terms of what I'm understanding right now. So if the employer did not have um, proper documentation or record keeping um, pursuant to the requirements under this bill, uh, uh, according to the bill, DLI would um, have the discretion to fine up to $10,000 um, for a failure to submit or deliver records. Um, and as mentioned earlier, in determining the appropriate amount of a penalty, we look at um, several factors. Um, some of the factors are listed in our um, are listed in our authority under. Uh, section 177.27 subdivision 2 um, and that includes um, in determining the amount of the penalty we would look at uh, the size of the employer's business and the gravity of the violation. Um, we also need to look at factors that are found under Minnesota statute 14.045 um, in terms of penalties or fines that are issued by an agency. Um, I won't go through all those factors in subdivision three, but they include willfulness of the violation, gravity of the violation, and history of past violations. Chair. Senator Draham. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gross, can you describe what um, you are anticipating the reporting to look at look like for, um, let's say, a, a, a small restaurant, um, what would they have to report to Dolly? It's complaint based. Ms. Gross. Thank you. <clears throat> Wanted to provide a, a reminder that um, our investigations would be complaint based, so if we received complaints, then we would investigate. Um, so we already um, look to Minnesota Statute 177.30 in terms of record keeping responsibilities by employers. Um, one thing that would be specific to this bill um, is, I'll turn us to um, starting at line 1.12 uh, required statement of earnings by employer. Um, this bill would include a requirement that employers in their earnings statements um, include the total number of earned sick and safe time hours accrued and available for use as well as used during the pay period. So we would be looking at the pay statement or the earnings statement to see if that information was included. Senator Draheim. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. So just to reiterate, so make sure I understand. So as an employer, the only re reporting requirement I would have would be to add a line on my pay stub with the um, normal hours that we already track and then how many hours of sick time they have accrued. Is that correct? That's correct. In terms of record keeping responsibilities that are under Minnesota Statute 177.30, the additional requirement would be related to earning statements. And um, Minnesota Statute 181.032 is incorporated into the record keeping requirements under 177.30. Follow up, Chair. Senator J.M. Thank you. So the, the record keeping, I understand, so it would be an additional line on the pay stub, but is there any reporting to Dolly or any other agency that is required by the employer? Ms. Gross. I'm, I'm not familiar with any other reporting that would be required. Thank you. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pappas. I just want to go back to the conversation about nursing homes and being able to pay for uh, this sick leave it's, uh, well, we know that, uh, that the targets for our nursing homes are underfunded. So it surprises me that uh, that, that uh, division, that committee is saying that they can just absorb this and they got enough money to do that. Uh, is that Senator Huffman's opinion? Does, did, is he the one that you talked to or who, ta who, who told you that the nursing home, that they felt the nursing home budget could absorb this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, turn that over to you. Um, Senator Jayheim, the, we discussed with MMB and what we chose to do, and this amendment takes out any of the state expenses where the state was um, being reimbursed. It was for the general fund ones, it was 200 and it would have been um, 127,000, 261,000 for the first two years, um, 261 ongoing, and that's divided by all state agencies. The next line on the spreadsheet, the non-general funds would have been the ones for anybody who was not in the area where it's general fund funded state agency. That I assume would include MinSCU and other things. But those were just the feeling as other employers, it's a, it's a, it's an expense for any enterprise, any business, any government agency, and so on. Um, it's also something that many of them provide, and this is just, I think it's a fairness. We're not, we were not reimbursing employers and the public for it, um, and <clears throat> same thing for state agencies. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I guess this question will be directed to you. So then the comment that, uh, so, so you're the ones, or you felt that this could be absorbed by the Health and Human Services Committee. This is not the committee that felt that. Is that a fair comment? Um, Senator Dames, the fiscal note that I saw in the fiscal note didn't list anything from Human Services. Well, if the Human Services, uh, follow up, Mr. Chair. If the Health and Human Services budget was not absorbing this cost, and now they're going to have to absorb the cost, it has a direct effect on that. And if that's the case, it's going to have a direct effect on nursing homes. So my comment is, I support sending this back to Health and Human Services because it sounds to me like what has happened here is that uh, they were probably never consulted to see what that impact might be. And I think considering that it's pretty well known that, uh, that the target that you folks have got for nursing homes this year is pretty well underfunded, especially if we take a look at uh, uh, what we know it's going to cost to do this and what the targets were, and now we're going to go ahead. I don't care if it's 50000 or what it is. We're going to go ahead and take that money out of there without even having, a, having this in a hearing at the health and human services level. So my point would be that I, I really think that we need to take this back and have this looked at. We've got some serious issues, folks, with nursing homes in rural Minnesota, and we have to step up to the plate and... and, and, and uh, deal with that. And by certainly, I don't care if it's 50000 or 20000 Every time we take a nickel out of there, it just makes it that much tougher. So I really think we need to send this back to Health and Human Services so they can have this conversation 
and go that route. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Senator Dames, just a brief comment on that. In the budget targets, um, Health and uh, Human Services Committee was one of the highest increases. I would have liked to see much more than that. I'm hearing from your side of the aisle that, you know, we're already spending too much money, and I, I understand that concern. I also think that, as you point out, Human Services has a lot of needs out there, and I wish we could do more. Um, but um, on that point, none of the state agencies and private employers are, uh, this is a cost of employing people to make sure they are healthy. And Mr. Nauman, could you comment on the fiscal? Mi Mr. Chair, I'm, I'll be pleased to do that. Um, the fiscal note was originally requested to include Article 4 um, that you all are having a conversation about. Um, advice came back from the Department of Human Services that the language of Article 4 was not specific enough thus to include the various job categories that the rate increase uh, for nursing homes was intended to apply and that they could not price it. So a decision was made to remove that article and the fiscal note that you have in front of you was intentionally excluding Article 4 because it was assumed that that article would no longer be um, in the bill uh, for, and so the price, uh, so that we could achieve a fiscal note in front of the committee, and this is part of the reason for the delay, is that we, we did some back and forth with the LBO to determine that the, the pricing on Article 4 was not possible in its current form. So that was removed, then a fiscal note, a second request was made, and the fiscal note was completed yesterday um, but essentially, it was assuming that Article 4 would not be part of the fiscal note. Senator Dreheim. Thank you. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not on the Health and Human Service Committees anymore. Um, but if I remember right, the PCA um, budget was well over $200 million. And if what we heard was true, the expense, what the formula that uh, Senator Pappas told us was three quarters of 1%. So the fiscal impact to the, um, the Hoffman Committee um, would be at least a million and a half dollars. Um, so I, 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 we're, we're not talking thousands of dollars, we're talking well over a million dollars impact to that committee with this bill. So I, I support the Pratt Amendment to send this back and have them look at it, because I do think there is a real fiscal cost to an industry um, that is having a hard time finding um, people to work and care for our loved ones. So I, I just wanted to point that out. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, and thank you, Mr. Nauman, for that. So I think, he, you know, Mr. Nauman's description of saying the uh, language in the amendment that was put on by Human Services was, you know, had some technical issues. I think it has to go back to that committee for and, and allow them to fix it. And the fact that this fiscal note was uh, prepared, assuming that that was was going to be removed without consultation of the committee, uh, I, I think is a bad practice. So, Mr. Chair, I renew my uh, motion to refer this bill back to human services. I request a roll call and that the results of the roll be printed in the journal. And, and members will vote on that in just a second. Um, this motion to send it back to health and human services. Is Senator Pappas, any comments? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I would oppose that motion. Um, and I did, did want to make one other comment is that um, we're forgetting about the employees in nursing homes and the competition and how hard it is to get employees. Certainly if you have a choice between working somewhere that provides paid sick days, you're gonna be more likely to work there. So I think this is a recruitment issue and we could bring tons of workers here in to testify on how the, imp the importance of paid sick days is to them. And do we really want sick people taking care of elderly people in the nursing home? No, um, because you know, you know, we ha we know what happened with COVID is it spread, and a lot of people died before their time. 
Um, so it's really important that in, these employees in particular be able to stay home. And at $16 an hour, they can't afford to lose a day's wages. Chair. Senator Drayheim. I'd like to respond to that. Thank you. I, it isn't about if they should get it or not. That That is not the issue. It's the finance committee is looking at the numbers. And I, I think we need to make sure we have the details figured out on who's paying for it. And I, I think a lot of us have heard from a lot of people that work in that industry that they're turning beds back to the state. They do not have enough employees. So we do need to invest more in that. So I, I don't think that is the, the question. I don't think that's the motive for Senator Pratt to send it back to the committee. It's to get it right. So I, th I think it's a, a reasonable request, and I renew my support for the a motion. Senator Dames and Senator Western. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Pappas, I just want to point this out. Uh, you're saying that if you talk to the folks at a nursing home, they certainly would want this coverage, and I, I would definitely agree with that. But I think we're missing the real point. Call 20 nursing home. You call how many nursing home people that are working in nursing homes and ask them which they would prefer one hour and 30 or a livable salary. And I can tell you it's not going to be the one hour and 30 hours that they're going to get for sick time. It's going to be a livable, workable salary. And you folks have the majority. We put nearly a billion dollars into this last year, and the House and the governor would not get together with us on that. This year, you folks are in the driver's seat. And you are a long ways from putting the amount of money that's needed to take care of these nursing homes. And uh, Mr. Chair, your comment that you wish that you could put more money in. Well, Mr. Chair, you're one of the senior members. We also have, I believe, the deputy chair. And we have the president here. We have some of the strongest members in the Senate here. You folks could make decisions to increase that. Take a look at where you've spent your money and decide where your priorities are. I think you have left the message of where your priorities are. And your priorities at this point are not rural nursing homes, and we need to do something about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pappas. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, members, I would urge your support of this amendment or uh, referral also. I think uh, just the discussion we had about the penalty is, is there an 80-hour minimum threshold or not? Uh, uh, the, the authors uh, working through this bill to understand it better. We, as members are, our constituents are hearing bits and pieces and trying to understand this better. And uh, we've got a pretty big concern here with uh, just how it's going to affect the uh, nursing homes and other uh, PCA and health and human services uh, type of, uh, of businesses. Uh, we need to get this right and understand what we're doing. And so uh, I would urge members, let's, let's put the clutch in, let's do it right, let's send it to the Health and Human Services Committee to relook at this uh, with, with the major surgery that was done on it today. Um, we, gotta, we gotta make sure we know what we're passing out here and understand this bill. And uh, I don't have the confidence yet that, that we all have that full breath and understanding uh, as I just the exchange and the uh, discussion I just had with uh, Senator Pappas. I understand her position. It's a lot to understand. There's a lot of hypotheticals that they haven't thought of, uh, and we probably still haven't thought of uh, sitting here in, in the hour we're spending on it today. Uh, we need to do the right thing and re-refer re it and uh, uh, make sure we've thought of all those hypotheticals. So I would really urge our uh, uh, a, a yes vote to, to, to do that for our constituents and for all the people that will be impacted and uh, understand exactly what what this is going to to do uh, if we pass it. Senator Pratt, then let's vote on the Pratt motion. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and bef before I respond to Senator Pappas, uh, you failed to ask for three hands to to record it in the committee, so uh, we'll get the three hands I out of the way. I assume there were three hands I and didn't I, ask. And Mr. Chair, I also want to clarify that the motion is to, to refer the bill to human services, not health and human services. Right. Uh, Senator Pappas, I, I serve as an unpaid director on a, on a long-term care facility. Um, Senator Dames, it's not just the rural, the rural uh, nursing homes that, that are struggling. It's the metro nursing homes as well. And Senator Pappas, we don't need a new mandate to help us recruit 
new employees. We need barriers removed. We need fewer mandates to attract those employees. We already make accommodations to treat our, to treat our employees right because we know that's an important part of not only attracting them but retaining them. And the problem with this bill is that you're putting additional cost on those employers. Maybe they don't meet exactly how you want it outlined. Maybe they offer 40 hours instead of 48. Maybe they uh, do something, you know, they allow for comp time or they allow for some other uh, accommodation. My nursing home doesn't want a new mandate. My nursing home doesn't want a new requirement. My, man, my nursing home doesn't want the additional cost of having to comply and worrying that if they send uh, uh, a records request uh, via direct mail versus certified mail that they're going to get a $10,000 fine. So Mr. Chair, I think this is, again, uh, this was an amendment that was put on by Human Services. Uh, I think the policy needs to go back to human services, allow them the opportunity to make the necessary changes so it fits within their target, and I'll let it go for a vote now. On the motion to refer the bill back to the Human Services Committee, uh, staff will take the roll. Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? On the motion, there being five yes votes and seven no votes, the motion does not prevail. Senator Pappas moves that Senate file, House File 19, as amended, be recommended to pass. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. I'd like a roll call with the results of the vote being recorded in the journal. Senator, Senator Pratt um, requests a roll call, and it will be printed in the journal. Um, the Staff will take the roll. Mr. Chair, point of order. I think you need to ask for three, show of three hands for the uh, comply with uh, the Senate. Senator Westrom, there were at least three hands. They will, it will be printed in the journal. I'm sorry if I didn't mention that. All right. S staff, go ahead. Senator Marty? Aye. Uh, Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Champion? Yes. Senator Dames? No. Senator Dreheim? No. Senator Eichhorn? No. Senator Mohammed? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Westrom? No. Senator Wicklin? Apologies. There being seven yes votes and five no votes, the motion does prevail. With that, um, thank you, Senator Pappas. We're planning to meet Tuesday of next week. Please watch your emails for information about additional time that um, might be reserved for finance right after break. And Mr. That's Chair? Yes. Can you tell us what bills will be up on Tuesday? Um, I believe there were several of them. The um, Senate file three is being moved till Tuesday. It was originally scheduled for today, and I believe led pipelines and maybe, I don't know if there are any. Disaster contingency fund, I believe, as well. And with that, and Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I, I would I would really like a commitment that the minority have some of the information that's prudent, like today, at least 24 hours before the committee. I think it's ridiculous that we're given this stuff at 8:30 at night, um, and we're expected to 
to uh, react to it uh, in, in such short notice. And again, I, I, I find it, it, you know, at best disrespectful to the minority, and, and I would hope that we could do a better job of working together. And Senator Pratt, we will try and do that. The fiscal, I didn't see it ahead, elections committee till five, and I saw it at that time, and I heard that it had things in it like the judge that wasn't in the bill, it had been taken out in judiciary and so on. And um, so, yes, I apologize for it being late. Mr. There. Chair, this this is not an urgent bill. This this could have been this could have been pushed off till tomorrow or Tuesday or whenever. And the fact that we continue to ram this bill through with these these significant changes, I just again, I, I find it a bad practice for this committee to be in. Uh, extremely disrespectful to the to the to the to the committee members and disrespectful to the public. Uh, Senator Pratt, if it had gone back to that committee, it would have missed the deadlines. But I, I hear your concerns. We will try and be as respectful and continue to do so, give information as soon as possible. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Mr. Chair.